best stories in sports. This is an E60 feature presentation. It is the ultimate barrier. One third of the planet's surface. The Pacific Ocean. A place for beginnings and endings and often both. When I go beachcombing, I often wonder where these things come from. They've had to be touched by human hands before. You wonder where did they come from and who actually touched them last. A hundred seventy miles southeast of Anchorage, seventy miles off the Alaskan coast, lies tiny Middleton Island. Four miles long and one mile wide, it's a windswept speck of rock in the Pacific. The U.S. Air Force built a radar base here in 1958. It lasted just five years. Now it's a temporary home to thousands of black-legged kittiwakes nesting for the summer before returning out to sea. The island's only permanent resident is the SS Colebrook. It ran aground in 1942. The lone trace of the modern world is a small FAA radar station staffed by a couple of technicians who pull rotating shifts on the island. Eight days on, eight days off. It's a routine 51-year-old David Baxter has been doing for 21 years. Working at Middleton Island can be lonely, but for me, it's not lonely. I like being alone, and it's just easy when you're alone to have your own thoughts. I like to get out and uh, walk on the beach. I need the exercise and I like to find things. Situated in the middle of a great counterclockwise system of ocean currents, Middleton Island is a magnet for marine debris. Buoys, plastic bottles, anything that floats. On March 15th, after work, I decided to go out beachcombing. When I first saw the soccer ball, I had a pretty good hunch that that was Japanese writing. It crossed my mind immediately. It was possible that the person was not alive anymore. Almost exactly one year earlier, March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake struck 40 miles off the coast of Northeast Japan. It was the strongest earthquake in Japan's history, but it was just the beginning. What followed was a massive tsunami in places more than 30 feet high that slammed into Japan's northeast coast. Entire cities were simply swept away. More than 15,000 people were killed. Over 100,000 homes were destroyed. The Japanese government estimates that five million tons of debris were swept into the Pacific by the tsunami. Of that, nearly 70% sank just offshore. The remaining one and a half million tons simply floated out into the Pacific. There, most of it still remains, most of it. I immediately thought that it was very possible that it came from the tsunami. I just thought that it was imperative that I try to get the ball returned because you would want somebody to try to get your belongings back to you. Finding the owner might seem impossible, but Baxter knew where to begin. I met my wife, Yumi, in 1989. She is from Hachioji, which is Tokyo. I had to get it home to Yumi to see what exactly it said, because I had no idea what it said. 
when I saw the ball, the writing on the ball was still clear. I was surprised because you can see pretty good. Okay, this is a Japanese writing, say Murakami Misaki, and this is an encouragement word, like good luck. Written on the ball was a boy's name, Misaki Murakami. She determined that it was a gift from some third grade classmates in 2005, and it was from the elementary school. So she Googled that elementary school and right away found out that it was, in fact, in the tsunami zone. The elementary school was located in the town of Rikuzen, Takata, a small seaside city of 24,000 people before the tsunami. Rikuzen Takata was, in the words of its own mayor, essentially gone. 3,300 of its buildings were completely or partially destroyed. Nearly 1,700 of its residents perished. One in every 14 people. We knew it was from the tsunami zone, but that is what started us trying to find the person, whether they were alive or their family was still alive and so forth. The Baxters contacted the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which has been tracking the tsunami debris. They posted a picture of the ball on their blog. Soon, the Baxters received a link to a website that listed people living in the evacuation center in Rikuzen Takata. One of the people listed was Misaki Murakami, the same name that was on the soccer ball. He was soon tracked down by the Japanese media. あ、あの as the news spread, the media attention on Misaki and his family became overwhelming. With those around them still suffering, they felt uncomfortable in the spotlight. They have since declined all media interviews. It's so hard for them to wrap around the one ball. There's so much stuff happened. They are very happy, but also, the ball means they lost everything, then nothing else left. Well, here we go. We're packing up the uh, soccer ball. In May, two months after it was discovered, 3,000 miles from its original home, David Baxter packed up Misaki Murakami's soccer ball and returned it to him. 14 months after his home and everything he owned was swept away by the tsunami, Misaki Murakami got his ball back. It was the first piece of tsunami debris ever to be returned to its original owner. It would not be the last. Weeks after the soccer ball was discovered, a volleyball was found. On it was a girl's name, Shiori. The girl likes writing, <laughs> and some of them had a cute pictures on the animals. The volleyball was eventually traced back to a 19-year-old woman, Shiori Sato. It too was returned by the Baxters. In May, Melanie Gigano, a biologist studying Middleton's bird population, was conducting research on the beach. I walked over to the basketball and I turned it around and I saw the Japanese writing on the ball. So I was quite excited, <laughs> that's for sure. Unlike the other two, there is no name on the basketball. It appears to be from a public school and reads simply, Boys Basketball Team. To date, the identities and the fates of those who played with this ball remain unknown. I wonder if they're still alive. Did they play with it a lot? And 
how many people touched it. I do feel a connection because we both touch the ball, right? We both play with it. The island itself is so small and nobody lived there. They could have washed away again or buried or something happened. And then somebody found the ball and he bring it home and then I was up beneath and I'm able to see all little things, the kind of miracle things that adds up. However miraculous, it's important to recognize what the discoveries of the soccer ball, the volleyball, and the basketball can't do. They cannot rebuild anyone's home or bring back the thousands of loved ones lost. Returning them is simply a small act of kindness, a reminder that no matter where we live, no matter how remote, none of us is an island. Although we may be separated by vast oceans, in the end, we are all neighbors. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports, highlights, and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.